Whether you watch us on Monday morning or on Friday night, we're coming into your house to see what's going on in your family on this episode of Inverse. Hey guys, we're in episode 12 on this entire season on the topic of families. We've covered so many different aspects of family, but on this episode, we're gonna break through the screen and go into your house to see what's going on in your family. I wish technology would be that advanced to do that, but we're not. We're gonna be talking about <laughs> what is the witness that your internal dynamics of your family show to the rest of your neighborhood. So we're gonna have a word of prayer, and Sebastian, can you pray for us, and we'll get directly into scripture. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that it is easy to be a Christian in certain contexts, but Father, in our homes are places where it may not be so easy. And so, Lord, we pray for your grace. We pray, Lord, that you would not only speak through us in this discussion, but you may speak to us. And we offer this prayer from our hearts in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Uh, Callie, let's go to Second Chronicles there. A very rare uh, book <laughs> okay. of the Bible yeah. to be reading from. Uh, not, that's not rare, but just not common. And chapter 32, we'll start reading the narrative from verse 24, 25, 26, and then skip down to verse 31. All right, those are very specific instructions. Yes, I want to follow them. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and he prayed to the Lord, and he spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him, for his heart was lifted up, Therefore, wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. And verse 31, However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him, that he might know all that was in his heart. Yeah, Siku, what is going on in that story? <laughs> okay, well, uh, for background, Hezekiah is, is a king, mm -hmm. and his father actually was Ahaz, who, is, who turned out to not be a good king mm -hmm. by the end of his reign. Um, but Hezekiah comes into the picture, and he's bringing up all these reforms, um, he, yeah, he's a very good dude. <laughs> you know, his, um, the temple and restoring worship, they have the Passover and all these reforms. But then um, he comes to this point where he gets sick and he's about to die and the prophet of the Lord comes and tells him, uh, the fullest story is in Isaiah, um, I think it's 38 and 39. Uh, the prophet comes to him and says, Hezekiah, you better get your house in order because you're about to die. Mm. So get your anything, you know, say your goodbyes. Um, but Hezekiah says, I don't want to die yet. And so he petitions to God, he prays to God that God would give him more life. And in response, God answers, yes, you're going to get 15 more years. And as a sign that I have answered your prayer, God performs this miracle where the sun goes backwards. Uh, and the way that it's put in scripture is, you know, they had sundials. And so the, the sundial went back, I think it says 10 degrees. Mm -hmm. So this was anyone with a sundial anywhere in the world could see that something changed. At least if the sun was shining on where you were, you could see that. That's true. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> right. Yeah, follow yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, so, you. So, so, so this is a sign that is specifically for Hezekiah, a miracle that God is doing in Hezekiah's personal life. But it, it becomes evident to everyone that something strange in the cosmos is happening. Um, and so people all the way in Babylon find out that, that, that the reason that this happened is because God performed a miracle for King Hezekiah. Mm -hmm. So they come all the way to find out what is this thing that has happened. And Hezekiah goes about, and in verse 31 of Second Chronicles 32, it says, ambassadors from, of the princes of Babylon, these are ambassadors sent from Babylon. Chapter, uh, verse 31. Verse 31, sorry, mm -hmm. 31 mm -hmm. of chapter 32. Mm -hmm. okay. um, they, in, they came to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land. Mm -hmm. And it says that God wanted to see what was in his heart. So when they come in, they inquire, what, what, what is this thing all about? Um, in Isaiah, it actually tells us that Hezekiah goes about and he shows them his entire 
household. He shows them all his riches. He's like, oh, and, and I've got this chest over here, and he opens it up, and he shows them all the wealth that has been accumulated um, through, through, uh, throughout the time. And the prophet comes to him afterwards and says, these guys came to your house. What did they see in your house? And it's like, I show them everything. I show them all my wealth. I show them. But he never told them about the God who actually turned the sun backward. Mm. And, and because of that, you know, a, a, a curse is pronounced on him. He's happy that, you know, he gets to live another 15 years, but <laughs> um, his sons are not going to be able to experience the prosperity that they should have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and let's also take note that his son comes out to be one of the most wicked kings voilà. ever in the history of Israel and reigns for 50 years, you know, Manasseh. And this whole idea that Hezekiah's house was not in order. So when he was about to die, the prophet said, set your house in order, mm -hmm. you're going to die. God extends his life, and rather than using the extended time to make his house even more in order, extending your life doesn't mean you're not going to die. It just means God prolonged the time mm -hmm. to give you more time to get your house in order. And by the time that God had used this situation to bring the Babylonians, who at that point in time weren't a great nation, they weren't a powerhouse on the earth, God was giving an opportunity to sow the seed so that a person like Nebuchadnezzar down the line, when he was born and would eventually become king of Babylon, he would actually probably have been born a believer in the God of Jehovah, the God Jehovah, and not into the false gods of Babylon. But Hezekiah missed an opportunity mm -hmm. that in his house, the thing that was most precious that he should have shared mm -hmm. should have been Christ. Mm -hmm. And he missed the opportunity. I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. To me, it's, it's literally mind-boggling how you could be like, I showed everything. It's the missing of an opportunity. It comes back to the, the topic of, of this week. Like, when people see the internal things of your house, what do they come away with? Mm -hmm. Is it like, wow, man, you got a new, you know, you know X59 doohickey 349 of <laughs> a million dollars? Or wow, it's fancy. like, wow, you know, what, what, what's, what's, what's the takeaway? What's the intuitive feel? And uh, I think here in verse uh, 27 of chapter 32 of Second Chronicles, <laughs> verse 27, Hezekiah had very great riches and honor. He made himself treasuries for silver, for gold, for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of desirable items. And in just all these blessings. And mm -hmm. instead of saying, hey, God gave me these things, you're like, yep, that's what I have. I think what's the scariest part of it for me is it doesn't sound like, and maybe I'm not missing a verse, but Hezekiah, it doesn't sound like Hezekiah is intentionally hiding God. Mm -hmm. He's not like, oh, I'm ashamed that I worship God, so I don't, I don't want to mention him. His priorities are just not straight. Mm -hmm. And he is more proud of the things that he has than the God that he serves. Mm -hmm. And so I see that, you know, well, of course I love God, so of course I'll talk about God. But it takes intentionality to show that to your neighbors, the people who come in contact with your home. I was talking to, to David recently, and we were talking about how... Who's this? Who's this? David, you I don't know how to David. say it. My fiancé. Your fiancé, yes. My, Okay. Your husband soon. Just want to make sure you <laughs> know. timing this is. <laughs> Brothers watch it in verse two. You know. Yeah, my fiance. <clears throat> so we were talking about what we want our family to be known for. Mm -hmm. When people interact with us, like, oh, that family's always this way, or that family's always that way, and not something we show off and we we shine up for certain days, but like it just becomes natural. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think we all want in our families is to naturally glorify God and to naturally mention Him and to naturally, like, it's like, man, you can't help it. And it's not like we're putting on, but I can't not talk well, about Jesus. You, you mentioned that even when you're not putting anything on, there's something that's still coming out anyway. Mm, Family yeah. is always homes, and, and you're always, you're always, you're going to advertise something like or other. Any a vibe. Any, a vibe, yeah. a, a aura, or, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. Careful. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but, but something <laughs> is being advertised regardless of whether you're trying or not. I was talking to one of my students recently. I'm going to always talk to my students until I have kids. And <laughs> they said... And then you always talk they were, about your kids. I will. Um, they asked me a question, and they were saying they were going to ask someone else, but they're like, yeah, I don't know if you want to talk to Miss Williams, because she knows She's, you know she's just going to give you a Jesus answer. And they meant it as an insult, but I take it as the highest compliment there is. Like, I'm glad you know that. I'm glad that you know when you interact with me, it will somehow come back to Jesus because Jesus is... I mean, mm -hmm. he's the answer to all I actually taught a Sabbath school class where I made fun of you. Like, you know, oh, yeah, Jesus. every time we have this uh, problem, and then Kaz well, Jesus knows. I know Jesus knows because <laughs> Jesus knows, but then... That, that is the answer. <laughs> end of discussion. Right. Appreciate. End of discussion. Appreciate. Yeah. You know, the, the, the thing that got me is Hezekiah, when, when people came into his home, what they saw 
what he showed them was his yes. wealth and etc. Yes. Um, I, I kind of am on the opposite spectrum of Hezekiah. Our family is not wealthy, um, and you know we, our house is not magnificently furnished. And I, I remember um, near the beginning of us moving into our home, and I was feeling kind of embarrassed, you know, how sparsely furnished our home is, and man, you know, we can't have people over. We don't have enough places for people to sit, you know, etc. And it 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 kind of made me feel like not wanting to invite people into our home mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I felt like there wasn't anything that you could give. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, you, it's, yeah, but, yeah. but at the end of the day, it became, I, I realized that our home is not the thing that people should see when they come into our home. The experience that they have shouldn't be that they sat on a really awesome couch, you know, or, or that, you know, the, the carpet was super plush. But th there should be an experience that beyond that, that that's beyond that, that transcends yeah. the, the drapings and the hangings on the wall, that when yes. people come into your home, even though I may not have riches to show them, but they can see Jesus in my home. Yeah. And so not to be ashamed of having meager resources, to still be able to open up our lives to people yeah. because Jesus is there and Jesus is the priceless treasure yeah. that people can find. And we appreciate you opening up your house to, to all of us. Amen. We have oh, our, yes. our, our inverse powwows at Siku's house every time that we meet for these yeah. uh, for the preparation for these meetings. And mm -hmm. she opens up her sofa and the car seat one and the refrigerator. <laughs> we love and, that couch. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the warmth of the house that is, is definitely portrayed in, in the doc office. And I think that's, and, and, and I think I can't really really, you know, emphasize that point enough because it's like when you travel um, to different places like going to Dubai and you see these like palatial buildings. Opulence towers. And you're just like, man, I mean, <laughs> this is ridiculous yeah. how much money these people have. Everything is gold, the trim on the, ba the banister to go up the steps. Like, what is the point of this? Not brass, but gold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you, you realize that man, you know, all of this you could have, but if you're alone and you lack things like meaning and love and um, deep friendship, this, this will amount to nothing. You're gonna feel empty, right? It's just like a golden cage. And I, and I believe that that's really what, you know, Hezekiah failed in. He failed to see that advertising these things to other people isn't really projecting you know, anything significant outside of, hey, man, whenever we get big, like, we need to rob Israel because it got a lot of gold <laughs> right. versus, right. like, man, you know, here's this man with all this wealth, but his true wealth, mm -hmm. right, is in the, the God who possesses him, not what he possesses. Right, right. Yeah. We see a special power that families have and a, sense, a certain aroma or a scent that, that's given off to all those who visit. When we come back after the break, we're going to look at how families can really utilize this power for the gospel, for the benefit, the, the kingdom of heaven. We'll be back after this. Hey, welcome back. We've been looking at the implicit and innate power that families have and in giving the, a certain influence into the communities around them and whoever should, should, so, whoever should visit uh, the, the families. Mm -hmm. And we've been looking at the story of Hezekiah. Let's go to Ruth chapter 1, verse 8 through 22. And some of these, uh, some of the, we, we talked about some of these families are intentional. Mm -hmm. Some of these families are not intentional. And the, the whole point is if Christ is in the home, it will be seen. Yeah. If, should Christ not be in the home, that would also be not see, see, that would be seen. noticed that as well, mm -hmm. missing yes. as well, yes. <laughs> so let's go to the story of Ruth. And we, we may be familiar with Ruth. Let's go to chapter 1, verse 8 through 22. And Siku, can you start reading from there? Sure. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. 
and she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Verse 16, let's go to Callie, verse 16. Mm -hmm. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. <laughs> now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened, when they had come to Bethlehem, that all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? So she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Okay, thank you. This is an incredible story about a mother-in-law mm -hmm. and a daughter-in-law. This is just a rebuke to every mother-in-law, daughter-in-law uh, relationship. <laughs> there, there kind of is, though. There. Um, <laughs> kind of supernatural. So, Sebastian, what's going on here? Shed some light on this narrative. Start us off, and we'll go around the table. Well, I think the first thing you see is there was something that Ruth and, and um, Orpah saw in the home of Naomi. Yeah. That even though, you know, their husbands have passed away, Naomi's husband had passed away, there's a famine in the land, Naomi's like, well, there's nothing here. I just got to go home. And she's saying, look, go back to your people. Go back to those. Find another husband. Live your life. Enjoy yourself. She's relieving them. She's not telling them, you have to stay with me to comfort me in my old age or in my widowhood. And they're seeing, they've seen something in her, in her house and in her family that they're like, even though I don't have a husband, I still want to be connected to you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's saying something substantial. In that, that society too. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. that yeah. a daughter-in-law of a different culture, of a different religion, mm -hmm. wants to stick with her mother-in-law mm -hmm. after, you know, her only reason of being connected to her was to be married to her son. Mm -hmm. But now when you see Ruth's comment is her connection is your people will be my people. Mm -hmm. Your God will be my God. Mm -hmm. So there was something in the motherhood of Naomi. Mm -hmm. And I think that testifies to what Ruth saw in her house mm -hmm. that made her stay mm -hmm. and want to abide. And I mean, the, the very fact that Naomi would say, she doesn't say, come with me so that we can find a way to make this work because I'm old and you guys are young, so you guys can go work, you know, and help me out. Right. That she would, she would say, even though you want to come with me, and that would be a blessing to her, mm -hmm. that she's, she's selfless that way. And I think that speaks to the type of thing that they saw in her Absolutely. household mm -hmm. was she was the type of mother-in-law who wasn't just looking out for herself, you know, um, uh, speaking to mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationships, sometimes can be like, oh, well, you, you know, you, I'm not speaking about my personal situation, but it can be, <laughs> you married my son, you took him away from me, and he's supposed to take care of me, and now he's all he thinks about is you, and, mm. yes. but she was, she was actually selfless in the way that she related to her daughters-in-law. Mm. I mean, which she was which, thinking about their good. Which mm -hmm. speaks to the fact that she probably wasn't an overbearing mother-in-law, voilà. right? And I think that's huge, because it's true. I, I know of circumstances <laughs> like here we go. that. Here we go. We're just here like we scared go. of Justin's here judgmental face. Like, here really? we go. And no judgment, just uh, <laughs> cautious of, uh, of the content Because to me, when, you, television. When, I, when I think about circumstances that I know like this, yes. right, this is not mine. My wife and my mother-in-law have very good relationships. Yes, yes. But um, it, it speaks volumes to the fact that it doesn't have to be this way. This whole misnomer yeah. and this caricature that, oh, the mother-in-law who's the mother hen and is gonna make your life a living, you know what, you know, because you married her son and she'll never like you, you'll never be good enough, you'll never cook right, you'll never take her to kids right, you never take her, her son right, no, you need to iron his shirts, no, you need to prepare his food, it should be ready at this time. And I find that to be a, a caricature that people continue to reproduce that the Bible is telling us here that, listen, that if it's all really rests upon the mother-in-law in a large way of how she handles her position of influence. Mm -hmm. And for Naomi, it's never been about me. It's never been about what I want, what I need. And that speaks volumes to not just her daughter-in-law relationship, but to her religion, to her witness, and ultimately to the conversion of Ruth. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's huge. There's, there, this is incredible for me. I mean, they've also uh, encountered horrible suffering. Mm -hmm. yeah. They lost uh, their husbands equally. They're, I'm sure there's some bonding that occurred because they both have lost their spouses respectfully. Right, yeah. that's true. And they, they bonded in love. But this, I mean, the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship is probably the weakest within the family complex. Well, you know? maybe the son-in-law, father-in-law could be a little... Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he's, okay, so father and son, I mean, it's a pretty tight relationship, mom and son, mom, daughter, but here you have kind of just, just, there's a reason why pop culture makes fun of True. this relationship. relationship. It's yeah. typically viewed it's, as contentious. It's contentious, mm -hmm. like yeah. but here it's mm -hmm. been transformative to be a witness right. and a very, very tight relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that, <laughs> you know, Ruth, Ruth in the way that she responds to her mother-in-law, is 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 also telling. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have it in the story, but just because the the mother-in-law and, and Sebastian was saying, you know, uh, there is an onus that rests upon a mother-in-law, especially a believer, mm -hmm. you know, to treat her, you know, her children and her in-laws in the way that is appropriate. But even the way that a daughter-in-law or you know the child responds to the parent mm -hmm. can be a witness mm -hmm. or becomes a witness. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, you know, we we talked about in previous episodes that not treating the other person based on how they treat you, mm -hmm. but treating them for the sake of Christ, mm -hmm. you know? And if in this case, you know, Ruth is the believer and, you know, um, Naomi is the unbeliever, how does Ruth relate to her mother-in-law? Mm -hmm. You know, how, how do I relate to, you know, this family member who may not be a believer? And that becomes a witness. So what do they see in my life in the way that I relate in situations that may be troubling or difficult, um, in times of suffering, that becomes a witness that can lead them to Christ, mm -hmm. and it can be salvific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the additional dynamic here is that Naomi was an Israelite. She's part of the Jew, the, the chosen people, mm -hmm. and you have a Moabite daughter-in-law. She's a different race in, in in terms of their social stratification. She's the outsider, yes. and in many ways, she's cursed. She's mm -hmm. of the other low class. You know, if you can put it in those terms. Gentiles. Yeah. But here, she doesn't play that game at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, she she's treating her like her own daughter. And even she says, hey, leave me and go live your life because I can't. And she, you know, she goes into the whole dramatic thing. I'm not, I'm too old. I can't have more sons. I'm not going to get married. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's like you can, you can use your life more for, for more pro, a, a profitable things. And here, Ruth, what, what do you think Ruth saw? That she's like, no, I, I, my youth will be not wasted on another man, but I'm following you and your God and your people. And like, what, what, what was that factor? And the question is, is do we have that in our own, own homes, in our own mm. families? A mm -hmm. uh, larger question then I want to open it up to you guys is this. What do you do practically in your own families, in your own households, in your own apartment buildings, in your, in your, in your new mortgages that you have, <laughs> in the new, new uh, wow. mini car, minivans <laughs> that you have? What do you, what, are there practical things that you do to p potentially expand that witness, intentionally or unintentionally that people have mentioned it to you? Fair I question? think I've had, uh, you know, my cousins have visited a couple years ago and uh, they hadn't had kids yet. Um, but when they came, you know, we had uh, t three children by then, and <laughs> when they when they got there, um, we were having worship to bring in the Sabbath, and we usually start the Sabbath by um, forgiving one another, apologizing. Hey, I did this, you know, you did this because Matthew five says, you know, put down your gift and you know go reconcile with your brother, and so we all apologize to each other, and then um, we sing a song and we have prayer and then we have all the lights off and then we kind of blow out a candle. It's like our Sabbath candle. And everybody gets a turn, all the kids, whatever, they love it. And so then we do that and we, we have worship again and we do Bible memory verses and the way they interact and we let the kids lead out in worship. <clears throat> and my cousin was saying when he left that he said, man, I've never felt so um, rested and restored. Just from being in your house, like watching the kids interact, watching them look out for each other, watching them forgive each other when they're fighting over toys. And it's like, no, you shouldn't take this from me. And they're like yelling. You're like, hey, you know, that's not kind. You should apologize. And like, hey, I'm sorry. Then they kiss and, you know, hug. And it's like, I forgive you. And he's like, man, like, it's <laughs> just, he's just like, this doesn't <laughs> exist in the world. Like, I've never seen this kind of thing. And one of my daughters was um, screaming and crying because she was upset. And um, normally, right, when kids start screaming, that kind of disruptive screaming, it's kind of like, oh, man, they're having a meltdown. And people are like, stop screaming. <laughs> right? They like grab the child, remove them. And they were shocked when I asked her. I said, hey, do you want to pray? Do you feel sad? And she immediately stopped crying. Mm 
mm-hmm. instantly. And then we just prayed together. And they were like, man, like, I've never seen a child stop crying because a parent said, let's pray. Mm-hmm. And so from, from in my family, I've seen that the visitors we have and when they've come over, they've provided um, so much feedback to us about the idea that the way we conduct ourselves in worship and interact mm-hmm. was very, very telling and very restorative to them. Yeah, amen, amen. One takeaway I'm getting from this entire season is we really got to get back to the, the basics of family worship. Mm-hmm. We'd love to hear what you guys do out there on social media, what you do to increase your evangelistic influence for the Lord Jesus Christ in your own families and in your homes. This has been a special blessing to my, to my family and, and, and the panelists here. Hopefully it's been a blessing to you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week here on Inverse.